Hello. So I've been reading this book, The Denial of Death by Ernest Becker, and there is a lot of interesting ideas in this book that I uh, I want to talk about. So I'm going to try and like give you updates as I'm reading it. I guess you could say like a reading vlog or like a read along. Uh, and I'm going to go with by the first three chapters. I'll try and do three chapters at a time. So the thesis of the book is that the, he uses the word the mainspring of human activity is the fear of death or the terror of death. Now, he kind of doesn't explain much about that in the introduction. That's just the thesis is in, is in the introduction. And then you get into chapter one. And chapter one is about this concept of heroism. Now, heroism for Becker is a pretty big, I, big idea. It's a pretty important thing. And he thinks uh, we've neglected this concept in our modern culture because it's actually quite a simple idea. And the reason why it is a simple idea is because it's just narcissism, or at least a main component of it. He uses the word, I think, underbelly, is, is uh, narcissism. Um, basically, he thinks that we have an urge to be heroes uh, for reasons related in chapter two. He thinks that the urge to be a hero is a reflex of death uh, or the fear of death. And the urge to be a hero is just a type of narcissism. So he would say, for example, that uh, giving food to the homeless is you engaging in heroism, which you need to do because you have a fear of death and that's just narcissism. Or you could say maybe like self-sacrifice for others is another type of narcissism. He kind of says that we have this urge to justify ourselves in the universe. It's kind of the, the phenomenology of what he's describing. Put in other words, every action we take or every facet of our motivation is just heroism. Now, I disagree with this. Um, personally, I tend to think that everything is motivated by hedonism, right? This is just my opinion. I think, for example, the pleasure we associate with giving food to the homeless is not that it's a sense of us being the heroes or justifying our existence in the universe. It's the kind of dopamine you would get from acceptance from the herd, right? I tend to be a bit more of a hedonist, but I digress. Um, the another thing he mentions in chapter one is that since everything is heroism, that Underneath all of our culture is, uh, sorry, under, yeah, underneath all of our culture is heroism. And that means all of our culture is kind of fallacious or fake. It's all phony because everything, according to him, that we do in our culture is for the sake of being a hero. So a CEO who works uh, extra hard to make like a really good company and work good workplace culture is engaging in a fake set of behaviors because what he's really trying to do, what she's really trying to do, is be perceived as a hero. The same thing holds true for like becoming somebody, right? If you go to, let's say, university and you want to pursue, I don't know, a degree in computer science and invent like a really cool product in uh, software development, that's not because you love software development, that's because you want to become a hero. And so the software development thing is like a fake facade, he thinks. Now in chapter two, you get some more interesting ideas as well that relate back to chapter one, the chapters are kind of merged, but they are separate enough. So the question, the, the chapter is called the terror of death. And the question that he asks in the chapter is what motivates human heroics? But he addresses a lot more than that. And he also addresses some points in chapter one. And as I said before, what he thinks motivates human heroics is the terror of death. Uh, he's, he, the statement he uses is actually that heroics is a reflex um, a reflex of death. I think that's like the state, approximately that statement he uses. And the examples he gives are actually the, pretty solid. Like when you're facing your own death, let's say someone's coming to kill you or an animal's coming to attack you, you can adopt bravery in a response to your own fear. And he would probably argue that that fear doesn't go away and that the bravery is a cope, right? It's a uh, defense mechanism of sorts. Um, whenever, whenever people go towards, let's say, their deathbed as well, they try to put on a stoic face or heroic face. And so in some sense, you can actually almost see an evolutionary argument here that a way of coping with death is bravery or heroics. And I think that's actually a solid point. Now, something else he does in this chapter is addresses counter arguments. And there are two particular counter arguments that are worth exploring. I think the third one is actually not really a counter argument. It's just him reaffirming his position. Uh, the first one is that people who have a fear of death were traumatized. So he brings up some interesting studies where children who had more traumatic childhoods were actually more likely to think about death at an earlier age. And then the idea from that is they go on to become pessimistic philosophers. 
And he does even talk about how for like Schopenhauer or Freud both had troubled childhoods. So the kind of the idea here is that, uh, and kind of what Frederick Nietzsche talks about, right, is that whenever he looks at someone's philosophical writings, he sees nothing but the prejudices of a person, right? So pessimists become pessimists because they need philosophy to justify how poorly they've been treated in the world. And optimists are optimists because they've been treated well and they need to explain that. Basically, um, what I think Jonathan Haidt calls like the uh, rider and the elephant. Um, the elephant is all of your emotions and then you're the, the rider just tries to steer the emotions. So in this case, your philosophy is just an explanation of uh, you're already drawing conclusions based off of emotions. And so there's one argument here that people who have a healthy upbringing will not have a fear of death uh, because they're not traumatized, they won't be pessimist, so on and so forth. That's one counter argument. Now, another one is that, because you gotta remember for, for Ernest Becker, the, the fear of death is a fundamental drive in human psychology. Um, another counter argument is that, well, sure, we do care about death, but it's like a natural level of concern. So you could say, for example, our own self-preservation depends on our ability to think about our own death somewhat accurately or clearly. Uh, there's also the famous William James comment, like the, the worm at the core. Eventually, like you have to think about it at some point. It's, um, it's kind of like, it's like an inevitability, right? At some point you're gonna think about your own death. And so it's not that we have this obsessive fear that's driving human psychology. It's that we're just naturally curious and we wanna consider our own deaths at some point in time. Now, Becker himself doesn't find any of these particularly persuasive. He still affirms the position that uh, we have fundamentally a fear of death and most of our behaviors is just heroics, which are motivated by our fear of death. That's still his position. He's just giving these counter arguments so that you're more well informed. So the next thing he discusses, I actually struggle to understand why he's doing this. I'm going to try and give what I think is the best interpretation of this chapter, which is the recasting of basic psychoanalytic ideas. This is chapter three. And I, so in this chapter, he talks about um, what he calls existential incongruities and why they fail to achieve, why our defense mechanisms fail to achieve anything. And basically the idea is to go over all the psychoanalytic defense mechanisms and explain why they fail. And I think he's trying to relate it back to why we can't really cope with our fear of death. So let me explain. Uh, let's take the first idea of like, um, let's just say uh, being narcissistic, like uh, having this a sense of we are like an idealized perfect creature. He says right away that uh, let's take love, like narcissistic love, where you have this romanticized relationship, you think this person's perfect, no flaws, but then immediately you could say, well, that person poops. Uh, that person is disgusting, right? At some level, that person is a disgusting human, just like the rest of us. And so fundamentally, we want to be idealized, but our bodies are gross. And so there's an existential incongruity. We have this mental realm, this symbolic nature of man. And then we have this physical nature of man. And the physical nature of man is really gross and doesn't, doesn't mend seamlessly with our mental existence. Now, there are tons and different types of ways that he reframes this. Uh, you don't need to go into all of them. That's the basic idea is that there's an incongruity between man's physical nature and his mental nature whether it's in a narcissistic sense or so on and so forth. But the narcissistic one is most important because that means you can't be narcissistic in the body. And if you remember that being a hero was in some sense narcissistic, then that means heroics in some sense fail. But on top of that, uh, he then says that we can't also therefore get rid of our fear of death because maybe mentally we wanna create something that lasts longer than us. We kinda of wanna be eternal in that sense as a way of coping with our death but fundamentally our bodies are going to die. And so when he's recasting all these basic uh, psychoanalytic ideas, it's in that context of existential incongruities and meaning therefore that we can't get rid of our fear of death. We have to go uh, about another way of looking at it. We can't use a defense mechanism, which in psychoanalytic theory, most defense mechanisms are considered dysfunctional anyways. Uh, except for sublimation, where it's like sublimation being the idea that you put your efforts into things that are more fruitful. So that's chapter three. There's some things in chapter three, if you actually want to read the book, that are kind of funny. Talks a lot about poop 
and uh, the anality uh, from, from psychoanalytic theory. But it's not worth reading the whole entire thing. I think what I gave is probably the best interpretation of it. So those are the first three chapters of this book. I will try and read in the next, say, six or five days the other three chapters. Uh, so far, it's worth reading. It's interesting. The ideas are straightforward. The arguments are clearly laid out. He's not technical with his language. He does say some things that um, leave you kind of questioning, like when he says, like, the main underbelly of heroics is narcissism. I don't know what that actually means. Uh, and, like, other things as well, he says, that are kind of questionable. Um, but it's a fun read, and it is a different way of conceiving human psychology. The idea that the fear of death is a primary motivator and that heroics underlines every action we do is a universal claim, probably of an oversimplification. But interesting nonetheless, I would still recommend that you at least try and read it. And uh, I will definitely continue reviewing these chapters. But with that being said, bye-bye.